being a spine surgeon is a great thing. <laughs> uh, how many have had spine surgery? Can't see. Too many. Too many. Okay. I'm going to follow the charge of the, um, of the meeting here, and I'm honored to be here. And I'm going to give you something to think about. Um, every system's designed to get the results it gets. Every system's designed to get the results it gets. In my office, I have this uh, picture hanging up, and I want you to tell me why. Of course, why is an important question before we get to the how and the what. The Simon Sinek uh, TED Talk, I think, is remarkable in helping to think about that. But every time somebody comes into my office, I know the problems. Andy just talked about several of them. Libby's written about them. Uh, I live with them every day, both as a surgeon, a CEO, a researcher, etc. And I know what the problems are. I'm looking for some solutions, and I'd like you to tell me why I have this picture in my office. Why, do, why are we sitting here today? I hope we're sitting here for our patients and their families. Um, I, I think the rhetoric that happens uh, in Washington is confusing, hard to understand, and has very little to do with this patient. But the impact on this patient, our families, our employees, on you is incredible. We gain about 10,000 new people in Medicare every day in the United States. Um, and the number of people who are actually going to pay taxes, the workforce, is going down. So we are facing not just a short-term problem, but a longer-term problem in how we pay for what we have that we already can't afford today. <clears throat> the debt per citizen today is somewhere around $4,000. That's going to... Uh, I, can't, I don't have my glasses on, so let me put my glasses on. about $36,000, I think. Yeah, $36,000. And that's going to go up about fourfold uh, over the next uh, uh, 10 to 20 years. I, I just wonder how we take on both of these issues in a system designed to get the results it gets. We all know this data that suggests we pay more than any other country. What I think we realize uh, is that we're not very good at the outcomes we get, given the fact that we pay more than anybody else. The only place in the data I could find where we actually look pretty good is in heart attack mortality. But in things like infant mortality, life expectancy at birth, unmanaged diabetes, et cetera, were not very good. That's embarrassing for a country, for the people like us who are in a city with all the riches we have in this nation. Private companies like Dartmouth, like Mayo Clinic, have large employee bases. We have 20,000 employees. We give them a raise, and we take it away by putting them on a high deductible health plan. It's better for our system, harder for our employees, and harder for the people of this country. My guess is that's going to continue. Besides that, our household spend on health care continues to go up. That's just one example. Issues like the EpiPen, issues like the decision to take Daraprim from $13.50 to $750 a tablet are inexcusable in a democracy. 54 prescription drugs that are commonly prescribed in Medicare, Medicare pays nearly twice as much is any other industrialized country for those same drugs. Open heart surgery is 70% more expensive in this country. One 
the price of a day in the hospital is five times more expensive. And of course, we're all familiar with the work from our group at Dartmouth on end of life, where that's the most expensive thing, where we spend most of our health care dollars. I think the patients Andy was talking about that are really sick. Do you want to die in the hospital? Do you want to see 30 specialists before you die? Most people would probably say no, but depending on where you live, that's what's happening. The Dartmouth Atlas work that I was privileged to chair for a long period of time, Jack Winberg's great work over the last several decades, since the 70s, really looks at variation. Those bubbles are um, hospital referral regions based on zip codes in the United States, and I took something I do, um, back surgery, which is a bubble chart there, looking that if you live in Casper, Wyoming, you're you know, 10 times more likely to have your back operated on just because you live in Casper, Wyoming, not because people in Casper, Wyoming have more back problems. If you look at those rates of surgery, you take some of the best systems in the United States, Inner Mountain, I'm privileged to be on their board. We talk about these issues all the time. Geisinger Clinic, look at the rates of spine surgery of these great organizations. I am a spine surgeon, I think it's great but it's way overdone, way too much, and the outcomes aren't as good as people uh, suggest. And if you look at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, we have probably the next lowest rates of the spine surgery in the United States. I'm proud of that. We use things like shared decision-making to help patients make decisions. I run the health system. I have to be able to afford what we're doing. I'm not trying to drive down rates because um, I, I just think it's a good idea. I'm trying to drive down rates so that patients get the right care and we spend or bill our partners the right amount of uh, dollars. The top data is just HSA data, that's hospital service theory. I thought I'd just look at the Mayo Clinic in the three major locations. And you can just look at this, so if you look at uh, Jacksonville, you're much more likely to get spine, twice as likely to get spine surgery than if you live in Rochester. If you have hip surgery, you're twice as likely to get that in, in Rochester if, as opposed to Jacksonville. And, and knee surgery, um, a, a little over 30% uh, more likely to get uh, knee surgery uh, here in Rochester than the other places. Why is that? The people aren't different. If you look at that data on the bottom, that's from 2005, and the top is from 2015. Dartmouth is having an impact. Shared decision-making is working. Rates of spine surgery at the Mayo Clinic have actually gone down. Um, that's not because it was doing it wrong. That's because we realize when, when we inform patients and give them good information, uh, they can make the right decision. This is work I did for the Institute of Medicine looking at health equities in the United States. It was quite depressing for me to see the inequities that still exist, the racism, the social biases, showing that people that live in one zip code are gonna live 10 to 15 years less than another zip code just by their address. This is actually a map looking at some of that work showing the, the uh, New Orleans area and the Kansas City area on the right. Just by where you live, you can have a 20-year difference in your lifespan. Remarkable. The things that really amazed me, the work done by the Urban Institute suggests that health disparities cost us about $337 billion, that they believe that reducing such disparities over, uh, over time, about a 10-year period, would save about $229 billion. So dealing with disparity and inequities saves money. It's not a bad thing to spend money in different ways. The most interesting thing to me was when we talked to the military that some 26 million Americans, 75% of our youth between ages 17 and 24, cannot serve in our military. 
persistent health problems, drugs, prescription, non-prescription, poorly educated, convicted of a felony, and obesity. 75%, 26 million youth are ineligible to serve. That's a national security issue. As Andy said, and, and Libby, other countries spend money in different ways. We all talk about the social determinants of health. In our committee, we added housing, uh, excuse me, we added transportation, because in Chicago, as an example, when they took down Cabrini Green, which was a <clears throat> mostly black community, they moved those people out to the suburbs 75 miles out of town. They rebuilt that community to help the tax base in Chicago. And these people are out in diaspora with no way to get to health care, to have the food courts they needed, et cetera. So as our city planners think about our future, as the president thinks about investing in infrastructure, thinking about the social determinants of health, housing, food, transportation, education, the things we were all privileged to have, will do more to change our health than more health care spending. And most countries spend more on those issues than we do. I'm going to make this a little personal before I end here. Recently, the FDA approved a drug for altering a gene where they take your T cells, they alter them, and they put them back in. It's $650,000, one treatment, but it can cure you. That was opposed to $800,000 for a transplant that might not. So people thought that was cost effective. The little girls are, are my daughters. The one on the left is down on the lower right now. She graduated from Dartmouth Medical School, now is at Mass General, it's an internist, uh, resident. She's sitting on my shoulders in the top. My oldest daughter, and the teacher have both passed away. My daughter had ALL. If I could have, I would have paid for this drug. But she was 20 years too late. Technology, advancements in science are important, but shouldn't be abused. Who's to, va who's to put the place of value of $650,000 on a drug? She was supposed to have a bone marrow transplant when she was younger. She had the disease for 12 years. We couldn't find a match. The insurance company wouldn't pay for it. Even though I knew all about the system, I had to go to senators and others to get the health insurance to consider it. And the story could go on and on. There were 12 years of a terrible life for a young girl who I love very much, who can't be with us today. We can't have those kind of things. People shouldn't have to fight for what's right. I knew, but what's the average patient to do? My average patient doesn't know these things, doesn't know how to fight the system, can't understand the system, just wants to be taken care of, in a time of their greatest need. Andy knows this guy. This is Dean Kamen. Dean Kamen uh, is the gentleman in a black shirt, smiling. He developed a Segway. He also developed the first infusion pumps when he was in high school. Those infusion pumps helped my daughter get chemotherapy for 12 years that kept her alive. He's a good friend of mine lives in New Hampshire. Recently, we've worked together on a couple projects. One is on uh, kidney dialysis for patients at home. We're very excited about that and hope that's going to happen soon, working with people like Andy and others, where people can get better therapy in their home than they can going to dialysis centers three days a week if they can even get to those dialysis centers, as Andy said. 
And the other real exciting thing is we just received an $80 million grant from the Department of Defense, and we raised $300 million to start to print organs with 3D printing. These are actual nephrons and bone cells that are starting to be made with stem cells because the Department of Defense would like our soldiers to be able to come home and at any parts that they lost replaced. Imagine what this would mean for diabetes, kidney disease, etc. And we're just in the process of reviewing some projects, and it's happening much faster than I could have imagined. This is really exciting, and it's a privilege to work with people like, like Dean and Martine Rothblatt. And if you don't know about them, you can Google them. They're remarkable people, and they're actually going to create the kind of innovation that's important for our future. I was personally involved in this. This is now a company in Sweden. Um, I do think that managing chronic disease patients outside of the hospital has to become the norm. Not, not managing people in the hospital, that's too expensive. We uh, took our employees. Can you show the video? I'll just show you. It's kind of Amazon, but I think the top 5% that cost 50% of the expense can be treated this way. Can we run the video? To your door. see this uh, uh, ImagineCare.com. Uh, I agree with Andy that um, most people don't need a Fitbit because they're the ones that run every day like myself, but I actually like having uh, um, to monitor my steps and my running. It's kind of psychological with me. We took our sickest employees, the ones who uh, spend our, uh, the most amount of money on health care. Actually, our employee population uh, is not as healthy as I imagined they were. Um, and we took those patients with uh, three or more chronic diseases and uh, voluntarily uh, enrolled them. The average savings was about uh, $280 per member per month. That's $10 million a year for us. Uh, we're rolling this out in Sweden uh, next month with four hospital systems. It isn't that this system's the right system. A million people are working on these things. All the companies are, but some way that we can bring health care to you in your home. I'm working on another project with autistic uh, people with Don Suskind, who's um, uh, wrote Sidekicks, where we're using um, uh, different apps to allow people to work with their uh, speak. His son, for example, um, only speaks in Disney characters. He's autistic. And for the first time in his life, he's been able to communicate with his son. All these things are now happening with technology. So at the end of the day, we're an aging society. We can't afford the current non-system. There remain tremendous variation disparities and inequities. And I think the biggest thing is a lack of transparency. If I could change one thing, I would mandate that for any patient who has a federal subsidy or care, that those costs and outcomes have to be published uh, by every institution, by every doctor. Nonetheless, I've shown you some tremendous opportunities that I'm very excited about. Uh, uh, and I'll show you one last one that I think is really neat. We formed a collaborative in 16 systems with 50 million lives, 70,000 physicians, and we took on some issues under Andy's uh, leadership with Secretary Burwell. One was sepsis. This is a sepsis family. 
We had a 55% in-hospital mortality rate at Dartmouth, meaning that 55% of those patients never went home. I didn't know that till we did this. We implemented a three-hour bundle. We cut our mortality uh, rate down to almost zero. We saved about $50,000 less per patient, $2.1 million in one year. And across the collaborative, um, if there was a million diagnosed cases per year and we could implement this strategy, we'd save a billion dollars and more importantly, 10,000 lives. We're working together across the country to do that. Anybody want to answer the question about the glass? Need a bigger one? <laughs> half empty, half full. Anyhow, I, I just think it's the wrong glass. And until we start to get to the right glass, and I like Andy's ideas of getting the community on board, we're not going to solve those problems. Thank you for your time.